Good evening. I'm Marion Smith, Secretary of the Royal Scottish Academy. I'm delighted to welcome you to the RSA Metstein Architecture Discourse 2017. This is the fourth discourse in the series founded to honour the memory of Izzy Metstein, RSA. Above all, the discourse celebrates Izzy's engagement with the discipline of architecture, his insights, scrutiny, sense of humour and acerbic wit touched all those he taught. Beyond the university context, he continued to mentor his past students and has been extremely influential to contemporary architecture practice in Scotland. Izzy was a partner in the Glasgow practice of Gillespie, Kidd and Coya. Here he worked with his long-term collaborator, Andy McMillan. Izzy taught at the Macintosh School of Architecture in Glasgow, the University of Dublin and the Architecture Association in London. He was Professor of Architecture here at the University of Edinburgh from 1984 to 1991. We are most grateful for the support of the Scottish Government in presenting this series and to, and to the University of Edinburgh for its cooperation in the use of this lecture theatre. Can I remind you to switch off your phones and to pay heed to the fire alarm if it sounds? Previously, we have been honoured to host three eminent speakers, Alvaro Siza from Portugal in 2014, Glenn Murcutt crossing the globe from Australia in 2015, and Peter Zumthor crossing the Alps last year. I'm now going to hand over to Robin Webster, RSA, who will introduce the 2017 RSA Metstein Architecture Discourse. Thank you very much, Marian. It's a great privilege to introduce the first British architect to give the Metstein Discourse. Um, in 1984, uh, David Chipperfield uh, wrote a book called Theoretical Practice because at that time he hadn't actually built very much at all. And he described himself being like a, tra after he had qualified, feeling like a train driver dressed in a train driver's uniform, but with no train. Well, um, now he has the most amazing train. Uh, he's built in Japan, in uh, Germany, in France, in Spain, in the USA, in Mexico, in Korea, in China, uh, and in Britain. And he is about to build in Edinburgh. So it's um, entirely appropriate, I think, that uh, he's coming to deliver the Metzstein Lecture today. He has pointed out that there is a difference in the way that Europeans see architects um, from the way we tend to see architects in the UK. In the UK, we tend to bracket architects, or the society brackets architects into professionals who produce buildings, whereas in Europe, um, architects are also um, expected to be something of an intellectual leader. And I, I think it's rather wonderful that uh, David Chipperfield has actually tried to take that on and has indeed taken that mantle on. So uh, it's a great privilege I want to introduce you to Sir David Chipperfield. It is an honour to give the lecture in memory of Izzy, and I'm honoured that his members of his family are here. Um, I was never taught by Izzy, um, and I've got no idea why uh, he ended up um, cornering me so often and, you know, twisting my ear and finding me in a bar somewhere and... Uh, criticizing what I was doing. He had no right to. Uh, <laughs> he had no, I had no formal relationship 
with him. And in fact, I can't even claim that I knew him that well. But uh, I think all of us that knew him did somehow know him well. He was a, um, a very um, someone that really made uh, an influence on you. And I, I did find myself in, in uh, uh, drinking whiskey late at night or even being in his house and, or having a walk around uh, Glasgow with him. But he was an extraordinary figure and, and therefore it is an honour to give this lecture in his memory. Um, my second technical challenge. Um, I will try, in the spirit... I was sort of briefed that um, I should try and talk about my work, not just about latest projects. So I will try and do that. I will use a number of projects to explain the way uh, we are working in the studio, but I will also try to explain why... Um, my studio started in the way it did, and I think ideas that have somehow stayed with us, and influence, have influences that have stayed with us. Um, strangely, my first opportunities uh, to build came in Japan. Um, I did uh, a small uh, shop in London for the designer Ize Miyake, and uh, he then invited me to go to Japan in 1985 and it coincided with um, the sort of bubble period, uh, bubble economy in Japan that lasted uh, the best part of 10 years. Um, and correspondingly in England at the time, you know, there was really no work. So I, I really took advantage to go to Japan, and um, I did a lot of small, slightly meaningless shops for Izumiyaki, but at the same time I managed to get a number of small building commissions that I think would have been very difficult to have obtained here. So, from my very first uh, work, I was always somehow traveling and being uh, being out of my depth, you know, I had no idea uh, about Japan. Um, it was a very strange experience not to, to be in another culture where you were trying to understand, um, you were trying to learn your own craft at the same time as, be as being in another culture. And I think this, um, this experience was something that made me extremely reflective about you know, what architecture means. Um, it's a sort of arrogance, in a way, to build in another culture, in another place. And um, I was sort of aware of that at the time. But it gave me um, a wonderful opportunity to spend time in Japan, and I think everybody that's interested in architecture and design um, gravitates towards uh, Japanese design and the, the way that the Japanese somehow intensify experience. There's something very, I mean, the word minimal, minimalism got banded around a lot uh, when I was, you know, when I started working. But my experience in Japan wasn't about minimalism, it was really the understanding that the Japanese try to intensify experience. Um, just thinking about having a bath, it's a sort of strange idea that you would wash thoroughly before you have a bath. It's not really the English way of having a bath. Um, and so that's not about washing. The bath is not about washing. The bath is about enjoying water. It's about the sort of intense experience of things. And that's something that you find continuously in architecture and, and in design. So it was a privilege to be there and I also had the, the added privilege that um, 
This, this was the second building I built in Kyoto. I did a small museum in Tokyo, north, in the northern suburb of Tokyo, Chiba. And Tado Ando, who was not quite so famous in those days, but was um, a, you know, an important architect, came to see this rather pathetic um, attempt at building a concrete building. Um, and then uh, sort of took me and said, next time uh, I'll help you. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and he did. And, and on this project, I had his technical support and, and uh, even what his contractors uh, to, to help us. So this was a, a, a wonderful beginning. Um, but what should architecture look like and what should it be? And I suppose I, I didn't only owe uh, a sort of logistic and, and um, uh, I didn't own, owe friendship and, and support to Tado Ando. I also, in a way, uh, owed him a sort of intellectual debt because I sort of, in a way, it's clear from this image, you know, I borrowed from what he was doing. And what he was doing was, in a way, uh, taking a modern language, a modern architecture, and by the way, it makes a lot of sense because it's an earthquake. Japan is clearly an earthquake zone, so you need uh, big plates and, and very continuous cage structures. Um, so Ando was, was taking a sort of contemporary uh, approach, was making a very strong and reduced material idea and then playing in a rather traditional manner with interior and exterior space. So it was, uh, one could see in his work this, um, this link back to history. And you have to think that um, when we were at college in the late 70s, early 80s, modernism had sort of collapsed. And postmodernism was in a way, um, you know, had, had arrived. And it was really the death of modernism. Uh, and a lot of us were very, uh, in a way, excited about this new revival in history, but at the same time were convinced that modernism shouldn't be forgotten. And uh, architects like Alvaro Caesar and in Japan, Tado Ando, I think, showed how... Um, Modern architecture could be materially strong, because if you could argue that modern architecture had lost its substance, you know, then you had Ando really making strong architecture. And if you could also argue that it really lost its radical position and in the process lost its connection to history, you could see architects like Monel, like Caesar, like Ando, really again looking at history. So this was an interesting experience. So it was a sort of a, a very strange beginning to my professional life, to be in a, a land that I didn't understand um, and sort of exploring architecture for the first time with any scale larger than someone's kitchen extension. Um, and of course one was playing with abstraction. Uh, at, a, at the same time uh, of course, while I was going backwards and forwards to Japan, I was still quite determined to try to find work in England. And this rather horrible image is of Henley. Um, and uh, you couldn't have a bigger contrast between you know, the Japanese city and, and uh, Henley, a Japanese city where the, the form of the city is not actually that important. Um, and to some degree, the, you can design whatever you want. The issues are not to do with appearance, they are to do with height and codes. Um, and those of you who have been to a Japanese city you know, will be quite shocked about what a mess it looks like. Um, on the other hand, of course, if you go to someone like Henley, then appearance is everything. Um, what things look like is more important than what things are like. So I would say that, you know, I would say simplifying, my Japanese experience was about, you know, what things are like. Um, not about 
it's not about looking, it's about feeling and experiencing and, and uh, in a way, sort of understanding. And of course, Henley was a sort of, is a sort of picture postcard of what things, in a way, what, what an English town should look like. So when we won a commission to build uh, a small museum for um, the Museum of Rowing, connected to Henley, uh, I very quickly understood that there would be no possibility of doing a radically modern building, or a building that expressed itself in a modernist way, as it were, against history. And um, I sort of intellectually thought, well, in a way, are they completely wrong? Um, isn't this, you know, isn't this a fundamental critique of modernism? Why do, why do normal people hate modern architecture so much? And you only have to drive around places like Henley um, to see rather unhappy 1960s and 1970s buildings that gave fuel to this dislike. Um, I also have to add, this was when Prince Charles was in his you know, most rampant uh, uh, mode attacking British architecture. And the planners, um, when I first met them, stated something like, well, you've got to think, would Prince Charles like this building? And I had to remind them that that wasn't part of um, the Town and Country Planning Act. Uh, <laughs> but it was clear uh, in the 80s there was a sort of societal refusal or societal concern or disappointment in modernism. And I sort of felt that, so this was exactly at the same time I was going to Japan, so I was sort of enjoying myself uh, doing anything I wanted in Japan. But at the same time, um, I sort of missed, I suppose, the fact that there was no resistance. You know, if you wanted to do a pink building, uh, you could have done a pink building. No one would have said anything about it. And therefore, the sort of societal resistance in Henley, even if I felt that it was parochial and suburban and small-minded, um, did talk about something else. And I sort of felt that, well, I knew that if it didn't, I mean, putting it bluntly, I knew that if this building didn't have a pitch roof, it wouldn't happen. Um, this doesn't seem such a big issue now. But you have to think, in the sort of 80s, it was very difficult for a modern architect to not do a flat roof. And you think, why? Why, why is it impossible to do a flat roof? Because formally modernism somehow needed to distinguish itself from historical precedent. And I think by the time we got to the 80s, by the time modernism had somehow run out of energy, it was possible again to think about whether one couldn't re-engage with things which might become familiar, that might have, might create some empathy between uh, a public who has no particular interest in architecture and architecture itself. So I, I sort of, I mean, I, was, I didn't want to lose the job either. Yeah. So I was being practical about this, but I, I did think that why wouldn't it be possible to make a modern building that took on certain traditional qualities. There had been precedents. I mean, we, we've seen plenty of buildings through modernism that, that did have um, strong textures and materials, that did have silhouettes. So this project was, was all about, um, in a way, establishing a silhouette that was familiar um, and, in a way, being subversive. It's a sort of Miesian building in a way, in, in terms of its order, and, it's, and it's, it's reduced in its detailing, and um, in a way it tried to be two things at the same time. From 800 meters it's a traditional building, from 20 meters it's a modern building. 
And interestingly, although I, sh I didn't want to boast about it too much at the time, Prince Charles liked the building. Um, <laughs> And it was shortlisted for the Mies van der Rohe Prize. So it, it, it was an interesting, um, I mean, it was, it was a really uncomfortable project to do in many ways. But it was interesting how it forced me and forced us to consider this societal relationship. That while modernism had a certain arrogance, um, one realized that that was at a cost. And um, I worked on a number of projects since, and uh, I mean, in, in a way, I would say that these two experiences, Japan on the one hand, for being, uh, for sort of teaching me and, and reminding me, as we're all, you know, as architects and designers, we're all um, concerned with this, the idea of, of, of what things are like, what they feel like, um, and at the same time, not underestimating through my Henley experience, even though it was very confrontational in many ways, uh, not to mis misunderstand or underestimate the representational and the societal uh, concerns which are about what things look like as much as what they feel like. Uh, this was a project that we, we didn't actually build in, in Martha's Vineyard. It was very soon after Henley, but I think it was... Um, uh, it, 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 well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how that has somehow become a theme in our work. At the same time, I, I think there, were these sort of, there was this sort of schizophrenic um, condition that I was looking at, at the freedom of modernism and the, and the extraordinary possibilities that modernism gives us by the fact that we can span in ways that we couldn't before. And in fact, we have to think about that because we are not, we're not limited in the same way that a vernacular architecture was in terms of its language. So uh, this, this dialogue between the, as it were, the abstract and the figurative is something which has been part of our work. Um, also part of that, this is a small gallery house we did in Berlin. It's opposite the Museum Island in Berlin. And it was, um, it was completed during the planning of the Noyes Museum. And it was very well received as a piece of, um, in a way, reconstruction of Berlin that was both urbanistically sympathetic, but, but on the other hand, um, clearly uh, a modern intervention, but it was also very material. You know, um, and I think that's the other thing that I want to talk about. So, I mean, well, to continue this talk about the idea that architecture has these two, two extreme conditions in a way. I mean, we are interested in making things, so the experience of architecture this building, um, the, the, the client got upset and still is upset. It's a, it's a brick building which then has a sort of uh, lime mortar wash. And it is an incredibly uh, beautiful surface. And people touch it all the time. So he, as when he's walking around, he's telling people not to touch, touch his building. But I rather like the idea that, that the the materiality of the building is, is, is so convincing that you somehow want to know what it is. And I think that's something, again, it's, a, it's, a, it was an, it's another lesson that um, if you're trying to find a relationship with, let's call it society, but in a way, the, 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 the people that don't have to be interested, then... Uh, Materials is also, you know, how, how a building, the substance of a building is obviously important. As is the experience and the spatial qualities and the, um, and, I mean, these are things which um, are inevitably appreciated. You know, the idea of a, 
of a beautiful view out of the window, about light, about a well-proportioned room, about a beautiful wall. These are things which are the substance of architecture in a way, um, uh, you know, is, is something that we have to be interested. We cannot be disinterested in how you build and what you build. At the same time, if we only become interested in bricks and handrails and staircases, then um, it's a little bit of a, of a sort of isolated view of the world. So at the same time, I think architecture has to find you know, this, this fascination and I think a legitimate interest in how one makes something has to also be positioned societally. It should be about something. And um, this is the building in, in Glasgow, the BBC Glasgow, that um, we struggled with, I have to admit. Um, but there was one successful dimension to this, in my opinion, and actually the opinion of the people that work there. Um, the, the competition set up the project in such a way that there were going to be, in, in a way, two buildings because there's two types of activity which happens in this. One is making radio programs by recording them. It's a sort of technical activity. And the other is the, the making of programs by the editing and by all of the things that you have to do before you actually go in to record the program or make a broadcast. And from a, from a real estate point of view, the way that this project was approached, you would naturally separate those two things. You'd say, all the things where you need a desk should be in one building, and all the things where you need uh, to be in a recording studio uh, should be in another building, which is technical. And I argued that the making of the program, the programs, was the core idea. So if you were working as an accountant to a to a production team, it was rather important that you understood how you fitted into this whole idea, that making the programs wasn't something that would happen into, in a technical shed out the back. And so we insisted on putting the two things together. And actually, there are like four or five studios, a very small one, a medium-sized one, a bigger one, and a very big one. And if you just put them next to each other, uh, which is what we did, they form a terrace. So each one of these platforms uh, is sitting on the roof of one of the studios until you get to the biggest. And this idea was to create a sort of common territory for everybody that I argued, and this was 15, 15 years ago, I think it's now a totally accepted notion, but in those days it wasn't quite so accepted that in a creative um, industries, working at your desk is one thing, but collective working is another thing. There was always this, we've always had this work ethos in the office that if you weren't at your desk, you weren't working. And this has somehow changed over time. And so we argued that this common space was um, critical to the whole organization in terms of forcing people to work together. It also meant that um, people would not go by elevator to, the, to their office. They would walk up the stairs, although people in BBC uh, Scotland assured me that Scots never like walking up hills. They do it too often, and here they would always take the elevator, which is not true. They actually do all walk up the, the hill to their office, and by that they meet everybody on their way. So, so there was, in a very modest way, a social idea. So I'm trying to bring these strings together that um, clearly it's an architectural idea. It's a sort of Adolf Appiah carved sandstone, um, you know, theater, very spectacular in architectural terms, but it's also in a way fundamental to the way this place works. And I'm assured uh, that it does, and that they, they have parties there and they have all sorts of things as well as the, the collective meetings. So these are the two strands that I want to sort of talk about continuously, this idea that on the one hand, one is developing 
architectural ideas and language and the, the, the way that one makes buildings. And again, one would have to say that we're at a time where the construction industry is not really helping us do that. You know, everything is going in the other direction. You know, that we are de-skilling construction. We are, clients don't want to pay for uh, options which on the, on, on, on the face of it seem more expensive than others. Although, we're always, you know, we're always trying to point out that the, the fundamental cost of a project, you know, 80% of it is fixed by structure, by services, by everything else. The, the architectural elements, the, the, the stuff that we are playing with is a very small piece. Um, so this is a, this is a commercial project, uh, a shopping mall in the middle of Innsbruck. Um, again, that was a highly sensitive environment, but on the other hand, a, uh, you know, a sort of aggressive piece of commercial real estate. And we tried to integrate the building into the urban fabric. And it was, again, it's, it's been successful on both counts. It was very well appreciated as, a, as an urban idea, um, that it responded to, to its urban context, which was quite delicate. This is the Mo Maria Theresienstrasse in Innsbruck. It's the most important historical street, very incredibly sensitive. But at the same time, it then became an incredibly successful shopping mall. So this idea, again, of, of trying to find um, the sort of experiential and the physical uh, and try to make a shopping mall become something which has an urban uh, presence and, and physically uh, strong, not, not, not just because it's a shopping mall, it has to all of a sudden become dumb, uh, and also take seriously the larger societal responsibility of, of building in historic centre. Um, I would say the next uh, fundamental uh, experience for me was working in Berlin. And uh, I'm going to show briefly, as briefly as I can show, 15 years of work. Uh, the Noise Museum, which sits here. This is a museum island. Um, here is Schinkel's famous uh, Alters Museum. The Schloss was here and is rising again, unfortunately. Uh, here is the Dom. The Humboldt University is here. So you had the King, you had God, you had the University, and you had the arm. The barracks were back here. So this was the, the node of Prussia. Um, after Schinkel's successful uh, Alters Museum, facing across the Lustgarten to the Schloss, creating uh, this very important dialogue, uh, and m making, for the first time, uh, a museum that had uh, a public uh, presence. Uh, after the success of that, the museum island expanded, uh, and by his student, uh, Stuller, August Stuller, who planned the next two buildings, which was the National Gallery and <coughs> the Noise Museum. Both, in a way, arrived around the corner, as it were, uh, and intelligently linked together by this colonnade. So while they were, as it were, behind by this axis and by this common element, they created a a new um, condition. Uh, and it was an extension, uh, the Noise Museum was an extension of the archaeological collection that was already in the, the Alters Museum and the National Gallery was the paintings collection. Uh, during the war, uh, it was, as the whole of Berlin, substantially uh, destroyed. And this is later, the, so this is in the 1960s, I think. Um, you can tell by the cars. Uh, National Gallery and the Pergamon Museum have been repaired, as has uh, the Alters Museum. 
it's obviously a someone taking a photograph from the Dom. But you can see the Noise Museum stood as a ruin. And it stood as a ruin until 1989, until the wall came <coughs> down. The East Germans had started to plan, uh, well, they had already started stabilizing work, but it sat for more than 50 years as, as a ruin, and in a way became even more of a ruin. Um, these are early photographs of it after the war, but gradually it took on its own life as a ruin. It became a sort of professional ruin. Uh, it wasn't just the, the bombs and the fire that had ruined it. It was then water and snow and frost. And so it, it had settled into being a ruin after such a long time. And when you went round it, it was quite extraordinary. It was a sort of, and that, this is how it was before. This is the east facade. This is the front looking back. The National Gallery is here and Alta's Museum is on this side. So this is a colonnade that runs around um, and you can see the central staircase resolute and the two ends and this colonnade. And it was severely bombed. Large parts of the building are totally, were totally missing. Um, but certain things remained. Uh, these columns survived, but then were taken away. And during the stabilization process, during the uh, GDR, um, other repairs were done just to stop it falling more. The, the strange condition of the building, I mean, there were a number of reasons why it wasn't repaired. Um, Partly it was technical because <coughs> the land it was sitting on was incredibly complicated and very fragile. Stuller had addressed that through his, his inventive constructive techniques. But it was also complicated because the interiors were all highly decorated. When it was built in the middle of the 19th century, Berlin didn't have a substantial collection. Mostly they were plaster casts. The way of turning the museum into a sort of didactic tool then was to paint pictures on the walls. The history of civilization was told through murals and decorations on the walls, which were actually more important exponents than the objects inside. So those surfaces were ruined. So it was very difficult to know how do you repair and restore a building when the decoration is so fundamental to it. So that was another reason why it, it didn't get repaired. Um, the, or it didn't get restored. Uh, the wall came down in 1989. Um, Berlin had to reunite, or Germany had to reunite, and the city of Berlin had to reunite, which logistically was an enormous project. If you can imagine, uh, the, the train systems had been divided, the subway systems had been divided, the sewage systems had been divided. All the infrastructure, cultural infrastructure, was divided. Berlin, West Berlin, was a completely artificial society where they built a new opera house. I mean, in Berlin we have two national opera houses, we have two national libraries, we have Two, uh, two of everything, because two national galleries, the Mies National Gallery, for instance, as well as the one here. So West Berlin was trying to, in a way, compensate for everything it lost, because the center of Berlin was on the east side. They also had divided all their collections, so the first thing that had to happen uh, culturally amongst the uh, you know, cultural institutions was the reunification of cultural uh, program and the collection. So the Museum Island uh, was going to become once again the centre of the archaeological collections. There was a competition in 1994. The museum director wanted Frank Geary to win it. Uh, he didn't win it. Uh, Giorgio Grassi won. The museum director was furious and refused to talk to Giorgio Grassi for three or four years until he was allowed then to declare that you know, their relationship hadn't worked and he was allowed to have another competition. Um, we had come second uh, 
uh, in the first competition. So in theory it should have gone to us, but it didn't. Um, Geary was fifth, so they had a competition amongst the first five uh, in an attempt <laughs> to get Geary to win the second time. Um, and he didn't. Uh, uh, and we took on the responsibility of, um, I should just go, of, of uh, rebuilding the Noise Museum. Really not knowing how to do it, but having one dominant idea, which was to take <coughs> an archaeological approach to say that in the reconstruction you should not lose anything that was original. The typical reconstruction project means ideally you put everything back to look like it was. In that process you inevitably have to remove historic material because if half a wall has been destroyed and it still has plaster on it but you build a new wall, the rest of the new wall, then typically you take the old plaster off and you make it again and you would paint it the same colour as it was before. We argued that given that this building had lasted for 50 years, nearly 60 years, as a ruin, the things which had survived should somehow be treasured as authentic material. So in the same way as an archaeological object, if you take a Greek vase and you have the fragments of a Greek vase, then if you have su sufficient fragments, you can rebuild the form of the Greek vase you will use a plaster base and you will position all the pieces. What you don't do then is to paint the decoration on the missing pieces. You use the plaster as a sort of holding device to give logic and form back. So that was our idea in architecture, except we didn't really know what that would involve. Um, we worked with Julian Harrop uh, from the beginning as a sort of advisor and we developed uh, this strategy, so I should say, first of all, we had to uh, rebuild the form. Two large pieces were missing, the southeast wing and the northwest wing, totally destroyed. <coughs> the, the, the logic was, you know, there was so much still existing, I wanted to sort of bring as much back as possible, and also to, to make sense, in a way, to make sense of the fragments, to make sense of the... Because the fragments weren't just decorative fragments, they were rooms, rooms which had survived. So, on the other hand, th this is the staircase hall, completely bombed from roof to the basement. Um, the southwest wing, uh, bombed all the way through, but strangely, pieces surviving. Um, so we were interested in an approach that protected everything that survived um, and in a way built out from that. So the rule was that no surviving surface could be removed. They could be cleaned but not removed. And then you can see, so this is just a, this is um, on the south side of the building, this is the south, uh, southeast <coughs> Um, cupola completely missing, uh, and you can see the condition um, structurally in a bad way. We, we actually also wanted to get all of the structure working again, missing domes, <coughs> missing pieces. And this just goes through. So then we started to repair in different ways, protecting everything that survived. This is the same room, just going through, <coughs> through evolutions of... of um, repair, where you can see original fragments, original columns, original pieces, but then the repairs are being done in a way which are sympathetic and somehow trying to bring everything back together. We didn't want a sort of yin and yang, we didn't want new and old. We wanted the old to be somehow wrapped uh, together in the new. And if you go through this process very carefully, then you can arrive at a place like this where, you know, from this beginning uh, you found something which is complete in some way, but you haven't done it at the expense. I mean, in this room, for instance, we know the room was blue. There's enough there to show us that it was blue. But there wasn't enough, in a way, 
to create it as a blue room again. In some rooms we did have enough and then they became the colour. But in this case, the important thing was the floor. We could, we could restore the floor. With it. There was enough pattern already there and we could recreate the domes. And the technique we used for all of this was we, would, we photographed every floor, every wall, every door frame, every surface. We put it all on computer. So this is a, this is a wall, this is a room. Uh, the staircase hall is behind that door. This is as we found it. So you can see that there was <coughs> incredible discrepancy between uh, fragments which survived, decorative fragments. You can see this was a trellis with vines and a blue sky. So this was obviously a trellis ceiling. And you can see some green here, but at the same time, you can see uh, the block work completely exposed. You can see everything. So we would then on computer, because you also have to imagine <coughs> this was a German public project. So everything we did had to go through an approval process. So everything had to be approved. So in order to do that, we first of all, on computer, speculated how we should clean such, uh, how we should restore such a space. So we went from <coughs> this, and sometimes we did 10, 11 layers, sometimes feeling that we'd over restored, that we'd gone too far. We'd, we, but you can see by here, we've softened, the we've softened the damage, we brought some lines back in. We haven't gone as far as copying the decoration, but actually we did put a little bit blue wash on this ceiling to make it. But the idea is to somehow give semblance to damage, not to pretend that damage <coughs> wasn't made. Um, the, the, the project was done in the full glare of um, the media and Berlin public opinion. Uh, this is the wonderful staircase that Stuller had built and it was completely destroyed. And the typical question from the typical Berliner is, why can't we just have this back again? You know, you're going to spend a lot of, mo lot of money, you know what it looked like, just make it again. It's a very innocent and obvious question, which is quite difficult to answer why one shouldn't. But of course, the intellectual idea is that you cannot reachieve it. This is lost. You've, you have things which have survived. So what you can do, <coughs> whoops, that's the wrong image for some reason. What you can do is somehow put back uh, the, what was there in terms of the space and the fragments. And of course, this is the most extreme space. It was so destroyed. Um, and therefore, th this was the, the idea to put back the form of the stair to repair the staircase, to repair the hall, um, and to recreate the importance of it, but not to imitate decoration which is lost. And it was a highly um, provocative and controversial um, strategy, uh, totally supported by restoration uh, philosophies. It's absolutely the legitimate way of doing it, but emotionally, um, it's difficult. Uh, and, of course, there was a lot of anxiety about whether this was the right way and, and a, a great concern. So you can see this is the repairing of the outside of the building. So completely, sorry, completely missing corner in brickwork, repairs to the... This is a combination of uh, repairs, columns which we managed to salvage back that had been put into storage and completely new uh, a roof constructed in a sort of this neutral manner. Um, the, the controversy was so enormous that there were, um, there were petitions and uh, petitions to Parliament, um, substantial enough that the Parliament had to discuss it. Uh, this says, do you want this or do you want that? You know. So very easy question to ask, ask um, a popular debate. Um, we had candlelight demonstrations outside. If you ever want to make a point, do it at night with candles. It looks very 
impressive. Um, uh, we had, uh, it was on every newspaper cover, you know, candlelit demonstration, um, and every politician becomes unnerved by s such a thing. Uh, we then, and we, 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 we managed to get the whole thing through the, this long collaborative process. I would say that one of the, the lessons of this project was the, the collaborative process. Um, I had to work with city historians, museum curators, everybody wanting very different things. And we brought everybody together to work on this together. I mean, in, in a way, we couldn't have made so many decisions in, in an attitude of hostility. You can imagine that every time, you know, every, everything we did needed to be approved by uh, 25 people. You know. So it had to be a collaborative work. Um, and when we got to the end of it, this, was the, this, was a, this is the yellow press, as it's called in, in, uh, in Germany, sort of the mirror or the sun or something, uh, who had been stirring up trouble for a long time and was very much against it. And here's the, what was called the snake. They, they queued for six hours to go in the building for uh, a soft opening before the museum was open, a year, six months or nine months before the museum was open. And the, the, they were, the press was there trying to <coughs> provoke people and get them to say that they hated it, and actually um, the response was very positive. And it became, uh, you know, thousands of articles, and I mean, over the years it, it, it attracted enormous public opinion, and there was, um, luckily, um, Angela Merkel, who lives across the street, had seen um, uh, this queue, uh, well, that's what we had been told, that she'd seen the queue, and then um, said, what's going on, and then she wanted to go and see the building, and then at that point she agreed to open the building, which, which was the first time any politician had, had come close to the project, um, and therefore, it, in a way, it, it really helped us um, when I asked her more about that, she said, don't be so stupid. Of course, we live opposite the building. We knew exactly what was going on. It wasn't, we didn't, we had every understanding of what was going on. Anyway, the now images, just images of the, the built thing, which shows you how the building now has its own personality. It's a combination of repair and protection and, and addition, but always... The, and, and sometimes, you know, you can see the results of the fire, you can see results of, of uh, you yeah, know, there was a big fire on the west side that burnt the soot here. Um, you can see the damage, but at the same time, there is a, an attempt to bring this into some sort of resolution. And it, was a, it wasn't, the, the, the media and the public were sort of worried, and the criticism always, was, I was celebrating damage and ruination, and this was yet another negative reminder of the war. And the reaction at the end was the opposite, that in a way um, everyone was surprised how beautiful the building was, and that somehow beauty had come out of this damage, and that was the, that was the sort of poetic, and that was what, in fact, Angela Merkel in her speech talked about, the fact that it was more about what had survived than what had been lost. So now the building sits in, uh, uh, in Berlin and it's, it's part of the landscape. Um, how am I doing for time? Okay, I'll speed up a bit. I now just want to talk <coughs> briefly about two projects um, in process uh, and compare them a little bit. So connected to Museum Island, so here's the Neues Museum. Um, after we were appointed, we were then appointed to become master planners of the whole, or leading master plan of the concept of the whole museum island. The, co the collections are, are under one umbrella, but the Neues Museum, uh, which historically was linked to the Alters Museum, uh, and did have a bridge to the Pergamon, uh, you know, th these were one group. In order to get to the Pergamon and to the Boda Museum, you have to go off the island and enter separately. 
the museums were determined that there should be, for logistical, technical, and visitor circulation, there should be a connecting structure underground. Well, they didn't know where it should be. And in fact, when we won the competition, the idea was that Noise Museum would be a sort of entrance building, which having won the competition, we then refused that as an idea. Because we said, you cannot repair and restore the building and at the same time put you know, seven million people a year through the front door. So it came up, in a way, the master plan came up with the idea of a new uh, orientation building, which will sit here. And that will be, we will keep the entrances of all the museums, the front doors will stay open, but there'll be one orientation building to deal with mass tourism. And we uh, started that process. So there's the Noise Museum. So before there was a real commission, there was a sort of, that was, we were testing the feasibility of how would you put a new building which would be, have some exhibition and become a sort of entrance. And we did lots of different versions and uh, they had, it had to also get you into the Pergamon and link the south buildings and the north buildings. Sit, I mean, and, and it was very difficult project to broker and also to come to terms with in such a, such a sensitive uh, historical environment. There had been, uh, this is the bridge, so the Noise Museum sits there, and these were Schinkel's warehouses. So Schinkel had built a series of, of warehouses there. In fact, when we did the excavation, we took all the wooden piles out of the ground that were still remaining from these warehouses, but they had been destroyed much earlier. That's a view of of the canal with the Schinkel warehouses. Um, so the question, in a way, was, uh, uh, you know, we started, I suppose, these were architectural exercises in terms of volume and, and um, trying to design a building. But the the issue that we kept having was, put simply, what should it look like? I mean, how, what should the representation of such a building in such a sensitive and historic position be? If one wasn't, for instance, as these sort of suggest, taking a sort of counterpoint that you weren't contrasting, because that would be probably the modernist version that you make something, and we did that version, you make a sort of glass box here, and the glass box sits in opposition to those. Um, we did a project, and in fact I don't have the images here, we did a project that actually got us <coughs> funding and principal approval. But I realised that without, no one really, I mean by this time Noyes Museum had sort of started to get open and everyone was very happy with it, and, um, we had credibility at that point. So no one was really telling me, but I could sense that no one really liked it. Um, and so we, we took a break, in fact, between a commission, um, and we worked directly with the museum directors. So let's just think exactly what this should be. And we looked again at the context. So, of course, you start with Schinkel's fantastic uh, uh, Alters Museum, and this is Schinkel's drawing, uh, being in the Alters Museum, so up on a balcony inside the loggia. So here you are, or here they are, inside uh, the world's first public museum, um, but actually they're outside. They actually haven't gone through a door. So you realise that there was a sort of urban architecture that Schinkel was using, which was the colonnade, the staircases, and the whole museum island was very much in that spirit. So this, we, we felt that there was a clue there. The other um, clue was Mies van der Rohe's um, riff on Schinkel, which is the National Gallery, similarly in a way trying to make, I mean, in, in a way, the most useless museum in the world, uh, a big uh, glass hall, 9.2 metres uh, tall, 
uh, with non-insulating glass on all four sides and no light control. Um, totally hopeless as a place to exhibit art, and yet, over time, it's become loved as a sort of temple. Um, and, uh, and, and Mies famously, when he was criticised for the fact that it didn't work, he said, I, I'm aware, but the idea was so interesting, I felt obliged to follow it. <laughs> Which I think it's something we should all try on our clients, but I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't imagine much success. Um, as, a, as an aside, we are now restoring the Mies building, and this was the last exhibition that was put inside the building before we took it to pieces. It's an exhibition that we did where I was interested in seeing what a non, the most spectacular uh, hall uh, of modernism, this column free space with these wonderful eight columns on the outside, what would happen if you filled it with columns? So we put 142 trees inside and made this um, temple. Um, and that was the last exhibition. And now we are, I'm going to show you a few slides because those of you who know the building will be horrified to see what's happening. This is, the, this is one of the two big blocks, the, air, you know, the, the duct blocks with the marble on. The building was appallingly badly built. Um, and we're moving, we're taking it to bits, piece by piece, 35,000 pieces are coming out. All the window frames, I mean, everything comes out, we strip it back and we put it all back again. It's, it's a, whereas Noyes Museum was, was one type of restoration, restoration of a, of a masonry building, this is much more akin to restoring a 1964 Mercedes that on appearance looks fine, but everything is rusty and everything. So that's what we're doing at the moment, no, you know, I mean, cold bridging all over the place, and, and, but we've been the guardians to stop the technical, the technical solutions to this would be to triple the size of every glazing bar, which we resisted and managed to do. So it will be more beautiful than it ever was. You can't believe how badly the building was built. It was, uh, you know, 1960s in Berlin, they had no money and Mies wanted a building that looked uh, technically perfect, but was very hand-built. Returning to the museum island, so the National Gallery, this temple idea was very much in one's mind. You can see the architecture of the island, the, the colonnade, this wonderful device that links the museums together, wraps around the front the east side, the front of the Noyes Museum, um, the portico of the, of the Altes Museum and the wonderful staircase, this representational giant staircase of the National Gallery. These are sort of urban architectural gestures, gestures at the scale of the city, in a way. So we were interested in the idea of taking this colonnade in, in a way, uh, I suppose, trying not to make an object, but try to make something which grew out of this uh, urban architecture. And this is the project, so this is the colonnade running around. The, the, the colonnade that we restored of the Noise Museum stops there, and then we, we run a new colonnade around. Uh, this is, in a way, our Miesian hall. All the program is subsumed, rather like the National Gallery, and this hall is is a Miesian hall, but in this case it has every reason to be a large useless hall because it's about people congregating, meeting, having coffee and deciding and planning their trip around the museum island. Um, we, we adopted an architectural style which we had been working on. Uh, this is Marbach, the Literary Museum in, in uh, the birthplace of Schiller. This is, uh, Schiller's uh, the literary center of, of, of Germany. Um, and we built this little temple. Uh, it was the first use, that's an exaggeration. Um, it was one of the more, more explicit moments after the war where the column was adapted again to become an architectural device. There is an enormous anxiety 
about classical architecture as it was, it was confiscated by the National Socialists, by the Nazis. And when we did this project, um, we didn't win the competition first time round, and then uh, the director asked to see me and he said, can you explain the building? And, and I, I kept trying to explain it and I couldn't understand what he was after. And then finally I said, ah, you're worried about the columns. And he said, yeah, thank you for saying it because I, I didn't know how to say it. And it was a very interesting dialogue that in a way classical architecture is so much part of, of German architecture and yet somehow there was a sort of break after the war because, because in a way the Nazis had, had uh, uh, debased it. So just another issue about you know, how buildings are read and how they look. Um, these are just the plans. So that's the Sokol, that's the base. There's an auditorium for 350 people, 400 people, a big exhibition space, a lot of other things going on. And then the, the upper level, which is essentially orientation, tickets, cafe, um, shops, etc. And it shows you also how in the lower level it connects back. So it, this building is a sort of link building on every level. It links on the lower level back to the promenade which connects all the museums together and will connect in those museums. Uh, on this level it connects through to the Pergamon and on this level it sort of connects through the colonnade back this way and also that way. So the architecture somehow gets, it grows out of the place and it sort of camouflages itself and you don't quite know whether it's a historicist building or a modern building. You don't know whether it's extremely minimal or, or in a way deferential to history. This is as it's being built and this is it about two weeks ago. Okay. Last. So, one project, again, okay, two very quick projects. One in Mexico City, a museum. Um, we've been very fortunate to build a lot of museums. One of the themes that I'm trying to talk about is, in a way, how does a building, I mean, we, I think, societally, we have less and less opportunities to make good cities. There is no such thing as urban planning anymore. I and mean, planning is, is reactive, it's not proactive. I mean, you just have to go to London and see what's, what's happening. The, the, the investment market is planning. And planners are somehow trying to put a brave face on it and try to sort of... I mean, our planners in London are actually called um, development control officers, <laughs> which makes it sound like... <coughs> pest control of it. <laughs> um, it's about holding back. It's not about... So we don't plan anymore. We don't actually make <coughs> urban ideas. There is, no, there is no legitimacy for that. Which I think is a, a, is a, is a crisis. And it's something <coughs> we, we have to deal. We have to make... I never thought I'd find myself um, advocating that planners are probably more important than architects, but I would actually go on record as saying that now. I, th I really think that we've humiliated the planning uh, process too much and I think um, it should be, as it is in Europe, a, a highly respected uh, skill. Um, but wh where that leaves us often <coughs> is trying through singular buildings to make public gesture. So the buildings I've tried to show, you know, the, the James Simon, the entrance building, is a sort of public building in a way. It's trying to make a public gesture. The BBC Scotland was trying to, to do that in a modest internal way. Um, and this building, and so th it's, it's a theme that I'm sort of interested in, or I think it's important for us all, that we have to think that what, in what way, if we don't have an overall proactive planning process, to what degree can singular buildings contribute to the health of the city? What can they give? Um, this is a project right in the downtown Mexico uh, city uh, and uh, it's a huge area owned by Carlos Slim. Carlos Slim uh, built his own museum here and gave a piece of land to my client, private collector, 
um, very important collector of contemporary Mexican art and has been for a long time and has built this collection and, and is very responsible for the healthy condition of contemporary art in Mexico City. <coughs> um, the, the climate in Mexico City is benign. It's always about 24, 25, 26 degrees the whole year round. There are some exceptions, but essentially it never gets too hot and never gets too cold. You can enjoy that um, architecturally. If you think of Louis Barragan in his buildings, it's sort of inside, outside. Um, and this is the Anthropological Museum, which I believe is one of the most beautiful museums. Not necessarily from its architecture, there's not a great photograph of it, but what happens is that you enter, you go through a hall and actually you go outside again. And then you, because the climate is so nice, you can just go in and out of the building all the time. And therefore you can enjoy this sort of, the openness between inside and outside, and you can exploit it actually in terms of publicness or privateness, I suppose. You can think of Barragan as well in that way. Um, our site was incredibly awkward, hemmed in between a Carlos Slim Museum and a Carlos Slim Tower, and more Carlos Slim Towers here. But in a very, and a railway track here, uh, this is uh, where all the big breweries are up here, so like three times a day, a very slow train comes past here, delivering stuff to the brewery. Uh, and a very busy road here. Uh, I'm showing these, these are development models. We work a lot with models. Um, and I was interested at the beginning, working on a sort of museum typology that was small, uh, small rooms, in a way, um, stacking up on each other, trying to create a sort of openness. Um, uh, but at the same time, thinking about how we might deal with this very awkward triangular site. Um, and then at the same time, trying to think about how <coughs> one could make public gesture. Because it's a private uh, collection, the client was very nervous uh, to, to make sure that the building offered itself to the public, that it wasn't seen to be a sort of fortress. And therefore, we were really interested in how that might happen. So I'm going to go a bit quicker. We were also concerned about how do you bring people um, through a very tall building, a museum. It's quite difficult, a multi-story museum. You have to reward people when you get to the top. On the other hand, the geometry of the triangle was very difficult to, to consider in terms of top light. We've done a lot of museums that use top light, but this became an awkward perspective, so we worked in other ways. I was interested in precedence, you know what that is, and looking at um, other types of uh, roof light options. And also the sort of, this is the museum we did in Wakefield, looking at the sort of sculptural quality of buildings and whether that can also be a way of bringing light in. So just rapidly going through this, these are, these are just evolutions of the, the idea of how do you make a private building feel more public. And ideas are also within Mexico City, it's quite difficult to make a public square because it gets abused. So there needs to be some um, sort of separation somehow, or at least definition. <coughs> In this case, the idea, the definition would be, you know, quite dramatic. But at the same time, we were interested in precedents where, you know, you lift buildings off the ground, uh, also you frame views. And so this became the idea of the building. We create a, a slightly raised square. The building is lifted off the ground. There's a transparent lobby. So the museum, in a way, starts here. But in fact, the two exhi <coughs> exhibition floors are here, and these are two public floors. You can see how the building sits on this square, uh, has this extraordinary roof, attic. <coughs> and now you can see the project. So we create this square. 
The doors are always open because of the climate. We, in the morning, you just open the doors and they stay open all day. We created a, uh, a public room on this level, which gets used for different functions, and then these are the closed rooms. So by these two floors, <coughs> these two spaces and the piazza, we turn an otherwise private building into something which makes public gesture. And the threshold <coughs> becomes uh, prolonged. So where do you actually enter the museum? You enter it when you step onto the plaza in one way. You're now on, because you've, you've gone up one meter, you are somehow across a threshold. The next threshold is what we call the skirt, which is <coughs> a, a lowered edge to frame, because we're in such a hectic part of the city, there was a, this sort of slightly Japanese idea that this skirt would frame and compress and nearly make in a sort of a cinematic way the, the vibrancy of the city becomes an acceptable thing. And this whole ground floor, this, this is in a way the third threshold. So the first threshold is stepping up onto here, the second is going under, under the roof and being in shade and the third is to come through this door, but these two big doors are always held open. And then when you get to the next floor, there's a big glass space which gets used for lectures and talks and different events. Uh, Fishley Weiss used it <coughs> as an exhibition space. And when you go upstairs, then sort of conventional exhibition floor until you get to the very top where you get this sort of loft-like room. So you've rewarded people by, by arriving in the most dramatic uh, space. <coughs> so the building tries to take on the air of being a public building, even if it's a, pri <coughs> it's a private initiative. Very quickly, um, something we've just finished, it's a small cemetery, well, a big cemetery, but a small uh, support building chapel and, and uh, um, uh, administrative centre, which uh, replaces previous rather pragmatic structures, which at the base of this uh, extraordinary uh, hill, with a spine running all the way up the mountain, with, a, with this cemetery, rather like sort of rice paddy fields. These are different platforms. And the idea was that we, would <coughs> we had to make a chapel, we had to make meeting rooms for, for families that were coming there, um, and offices for the staff, a dining room, etc., etc. It's, it's a sort of combination of different things. And I'm just showing this to show the sort of um, physical and conceptual process that we go through, and always using large-scale models. So we, first of all, this is the chapel, this is the administrative building and, and different functions. There's the staircase. Um, that was the first concept. Then we sort of developed this. Then there was a sort of sense that actually this axis, what, these buildings were really making an, a gateway, an entrance. So they were buildings, but also a place to begin this journey. Gradually evolving, we <coughs> moved the chapel onto this side. And then this is somewhat the final scheme in a way. The building then took on a shape which configured, so instead of being lots of separate things, the separate things consumed into one, absorbed into one overall roof structure which mirrors the, the mountain. Another model showing the evolution of that. So it's, you, you enter, there's a garden, there are meeting rooms here, the cafe here, the chapel here with its own garden, an entrance from the car park. It's a simple program, but so here you can see how these forms just start evolving, both as, in a way, as a sculptural form and as also a spatial organization of internal rooms, using large scale models to develop the idea, and then looking at how we can create this slightly spiritual attitude. 
it began very much that there was sort of administrative buildings and a very spiritual chapel. And in the end, we tried to make the whole place have the same feeling, so that the chapel and the other buildings, in a way, have the same atmosphere. This was the, mo the model showing how you enter. And here's the, the plan. So you enter here. There's a, there's a beautiful garden as you come in. The, the offices are here. These are family meeting rooms, bathrooms and things here, dining room here, uh, more, uh, sorry, reception here, <coughs> entrance from car park, and here's the chapel. And there's the stair which takes you up. And this is in the process. It was all done in monolithic concrete and then sandblasted. And the idea was that in the way the building appeared and disappeared, that <coughs> it was somehow ambiguous as an object, but it was both a space uh, and a building. And it tried to find this balance between having a form on the one hand and also being an experience in terms of being there. So returning to that theme of, you know, in a way I've gone the whole circuit <coughs> starting in Japan, and this was our last building in Japan, um, sort of 25, 30 years later, 25 years later. Um, and in a way, enjoying the the ideas that uh, I have benefited from. And yeah, creating a sort of series of, of incidents and a series of spaces, which in one sense are uh, separate, but then linked together by this overriding <coughs> structural form. And always intensifying the, the idea of the place. That's the last image. Thank you very much. Your um, brick house in Berlin, I remember you saying to me, you felt was in the tradition of Berlin brick houses like Mies and, mm, mm. and others. Yeah. Was yeah, that I mean a conscious move? Or yeah, I mean, it's a cliche to, to sort of say you, you're trying to dig and find, you know, you're always trying to find the project as opposed to land it. I mean, that, I would say, you know, that's, uh, that's an approach that one has. On the other hand, sometimes there's not, you know, you're digging and there's nothing there. You know, I mean, there are places where you dig a little bit and it's rich. You, you can find a lot of clues. Uh, physically, culturally, topographically, you know, I mean, working in Japan, in the forest, I mean, it's, you know, you can find, you can find, if you just keep digging and you keep asking of yourself, um, you know, I think it's quite a Japanese building, but it's not a parody of Japan. Um, the Humex um, is regarded by architects there as being a very Mexican building, um, and I think it is. But it's not trying to be a Mexican building, it's just you, you try to you try to, to, to find something, or you, you find a lot, you know, you're just, by iteration and iteration, you're, you're trying to find something which is not, and, and you can't say, it's not scientific. It's, it's totally um, superficial in a way. It's, it's like the Rome Museum. I mean, it's a bit corny. Oh yeah, boathouses, they have funny, you know, they have pitch roofs and uh, you clad it in wood and so you're contextual. I mean, what does contextual mean? So it's, you know, we, we've used the word contextual a bit too loosely. Um, but certainly trying to find a place to begin. Um, that doesn't mean that one can't, uh, you know, again, I don't think, you know, we worked in Alaska. It's quite difficult to find things in Alaska. I mean, there's, you know, unless you're going to build it out of logs. Um, or ice. Or ice, yeah. So therefore, you've got to look in a slightly different way. You've got to think... Um, or if you're building on railway land somewhere. I mean, there's not much physical context or urban context. Or so, you know, it, it's not, it's, you know. Yeah, I, I just think one's looking, one's looking for an intellectual piece of grit that around which the oyster can grow. 
I think you've been pretty successful in this, and I, I believe you were introduced to Angela Merkel as one of our best young German architects. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't say young. <laughs> I'd like to say that um, we had an interview with uh, Richard Murphy, and I interviewed uh, Sir David a few months ago, and that interview is in this little book, along with some very nice photographs of, uh, of his buildings. Um, this little book has the advantage that you don't need sort of wheels to um, drag it along behind you, because there are a number of other books um, which are very expensive, and uh, um, you know, you can, the libraries will buy them, no doubt, but uh, uh, we can recommend this to you. Uh, I'm really impressed the way um, we've been taken through the buildings and the reasons for them and how ideas have changed. One of the things Sir David has said in the past is that he takes an idea and then he shakes it and shakes it until it's sorted. And I, I sort of get the feeling of that from, from some of the things he's been talking today, that these buildings, a sort of inevitability about them in the end emerges, um, which I think is a mark of an extraordinarily good architect. And another thing that he mentioned when we were talking to him was that he was sitting in a building uh, with a, a Japanese monk and um, he, he realized that uh, there was nowhere he really other that he wanted to be. Uh, and, and that it was this intensity of experience in a place that actually architecture um, was a good thing for architecture to achieve. And that really good buildings are very difficult to leave. And that is something which um, he's again shown us. Uh, so uh, I'm going to just step slightly out of a uh, program here for a moment because Richard Murphy, who's here quietly dying of a cough, um, <laughs> is, uh, was a guy who actually thought that these uh, discourses would be a, a good way of remembering Izzy. And he has also produced a book about a museum, and it actually damn near does need a couple of wheels to pull <laughs> along afterwards. But it's going, he's, he's written about Castle Vecchio um, a lot. And this, I think, is his third or fourth book. Is it? Um, but this one is really uh, detailed. In fact, <laughs> I, <laughs> I can't think of many buildings which could stand up to this sort of scrutiny. Um, but it's going to come out in November, and this is a good opportunity, really, to say, uh, you know, don't forget to buy it. On behalf of the Academy, I'm delighted to present Sir David with the Royal Scottish Academy Medal for Architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.